The National Bureau of Economic Research declared contractions in December 2007 and February 2020. Yet in both moments, credit spreads were calm weeks earlier while hiring still looked fine. That contradiction is the point. Recessions don't wait for headlines. Institutions feel the turn first. Here's why that matters. When the plumbing of money tightens while growth looks okay, the system is flagging a mismatch between demand, supply and the cost of time. It happened before the 1974 downturn as energy costs spiked while inventories stayed high. It happened again before 2008 as credit kept expanding while collateral quality fell. When those combos appear, a contraction is no accident. Now the mechanism. A recession begins when spending and production slip together, not as a mood swing, but as arithmetic. Debt taken at low coupons must be rolled at higher coupons. Margins thin, hiring slows, inventories rise, credit losses get recognised. The cycle pulls back. That's the chain. Here's the path we'll follow. First, the signals that tend to lead the turn, then the pattern across three eras. After that, the plumbing how rates, credit and cash flows push firms to slow. Finally, the players that amplify or dampen the damage. And what thresholds decide contraction versus recovery? The deeper current. What sets the recession in motion? Here's what matters first. Recessions are balance problems. Demand falls relative to supply or supply falls relative to demand and prices and rates try to clear the gap. When they can't clear quickly, output drops. That's not philosophy. It's the factory floor, the freight schedule and the bank credit committee sharing one outcome. So what are the early tells? Start with policy, not prices. When the Federal Reserve tightens financial conditions into slowing growth, the system is forced to reprice plans. In late 2006, the federal funds rate sat above 5%, while private credit creation was still rising through structured products. By December 2007, the US economy was in recession. In plain English, the cost of time went up while cash flows were built for cheaper time. Here's a second tell. The inventory to sales ratio climbs while purchasing managers' indexes slide below 50. In the early months of 2001, tech orders cooled even as warehouses filled. The result was a corporate recession, even before consumers quit. That mismatch shows up again and again. Too much product, not enough turnover. So what about unemployment? It's lagging. In 1982, the jobless rate peaked near 10.8% months after the tightest policy when the funds rate had punched above 20% in 1981 to crush inflation. In 2009, unemployment touched 10% after the seizure in credit had already forced output down. Jobs confirm the pain. They rarely call it in advance. In short, recessions begin upstream finance first, production second, labour third. The pattern across eras, different triggers, same mechanics. Here's a clean timeline. In 1973 and 1974, a supply shock hit first. Oil prices jumped several times over after the embargo. The cost shock rippled through transport, plastics and power. The Federal Reserve hesitated, then tightened. Output fell as firms couldn't pass along all costs. Europe and Japan felt it too because the shock hit a global input. Now look at 1981 and 1982. The trigger was policy on purpose. The Fed under Paul Volcker drove rates above 20% to break inflation. Money got expensive by design. Housing starts plunged. Manufacturing contracted. The downturn was steep but set the stage for disinflation after 1982. Because different, mechanism the same. Cash flows built for cheap time met, expensive time. Jump to 2001. The dot-com bust wasn't about oil or a deliberate squeeze. It was overinvestment in one sector. The Nasdaq had surged into 2000, financing networks and servers far ahead of profits. When demand failed to meet the promises, capital spending collapsed. That downturn was mild in headline GDP, but severe for tech and telecom employment. Again, balance broke, this time on the investment line. Then 2008 and 2009. Credit excess and weak collateral sat under a calm surface. Mortgage debt grew faster than incomes through 2006. When adjustable rates reset, losses spread through securities that had been treated as safe. Interbank lending froze in September 2008 after a single investment bank failed. Output contracted as trade finance and working capital dried up. The arithmetic was ruthless. A small rise in defaults erased the thin capital buffers at leveraged institutions. Finally, 2020. A health shock forced a sudden stop. Real GDP fell at an annualised pace above 30% in the second quarter of 2020. 
then rebounded as policy and reopening restored flows. The trigger was unique. The mechanics were familiar. When production stops while debts keep ticking, policy must bridge the cash flow gap to prevent permanent damage. Here's the through line. Different causes, energy, policy, sector investment, credit or health created the same stress. Commitments made in one environment colliding with a new one. Promise cash in, promise cash out. When those don't match, output resets lower. Stay to the end for three tells that decide contraction versus recovery. The mechanism. How a slowdown becomes a recession. Here's the thing about debt. A coupon. The interest payment promised each period doesn't care about intentions. When a firm issued bonds at 3% in 2021 and faces 5% at refinance in 2026, interest expense rises even if sales stay flat. The share of revenue going to interest squeezes hiring and investment. Multiply that across sectors and the investment line falls together. So what converts slower investment into outright contraction? Banks. When loan losses rise, banks increase provisions, a set aside for expected losses. That lowers capital ratios. With capital tighter, banks lend less per dollar of deposits. Credit creation slows. Smaller firms which rely on banks more than bond markets pull back hardest. Purchasing managers cut orders. Suppliers carry inventory longer. Freight rates soften. The loop closes back on employment. Now add households. When inflation runs ahead of pay for a stretch, real incomes fall. If policy rates rise at the same time, big ticket items, houses, cars, appliances stall. Housing is especially sensitive. Mortgage rates double and housing starts can halve. In 1982, starts fell to levels not seen in decades as rates crushed affordability. In 2022 and 2023, higher mortgage rates slowed sales even with low supply. Less housing activity means fewer related jobs and orders for lumber, copper and furnishings. So where does policy come in? The Federal Reserve sets the overnight rate. The US Treasury manages issuance. Together they shape the cost and availability of money. If the Fed tightens to cool inflation, while Treasury increases borrowing to cover a larger deficit, the term premium, the extra yield, paid on longer debt, can rise. Real yields, the inflation-adjusted cost of money can rise too. When real yields rise into softening growth, the incentive to delay projects goes up. Firms wait. Waiting is contraction in slow motion. In short, recessions are cash flow math meeting bank balance sheet math. The players, who amplifies, who absorbs, start with central banks. The Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England tighten to slow price growth. That's their mandate. But tightening has lags. In 2006, the peak rate arrived months before the recession start. In 2018, tightening added pressure to leveraged sectors, even without a recession that year. The lesson is simple. Set policy for inflation, and growth takes the hit later if cash flows are fragile. Now look at treasuries and finance ministries. When deficits widen late in the cycle, issuance climbs just as private credit weakens. In 2009, stimulus spending and automatic stabilizers lifted deficits to fight the downturn. In 2020, emergency programs did the same at larger scale. The intent is to bridge the gap. The risk appears when debt service crowds out room to respond in the next cycle. Interest costs can overtake large budget lines. When that happens, voters and markets both constrain options. Then there are banks and shadow lenders. During expansions, underwriting drifts, covenants loosen, leverage inches higher. It's slow. Then a turn forces recognition. Losses crystallize. Banks pull back. Non-bank lenders, which rely on short-term funding, reprice or pause. The mix decides the depth. Bank-centric systems contract faster, but often heal quicker under policy support. Market-centric systems can transmit stress broadly through asset prices, even without bank failures. Don't skip corporates. Balance sheets differ. Firms with fixed-rate, long-maturity debt ride through a spike in rates. Firms that borrowed short must refinance fast. Look at 2008. Investment-grade issuers survived. Highly leveraged, floating-rate borrowers didn't. Look at 2020. Firms with access to central bank backstop markets issued record sums and built cash. Small firms without that access leaned on banks and grants. Households matter too. When savings buffers exist like in early 2021, after large transfers consumption holds up longer. When buffers fade, spending slows, first on durables, then on services. Confidence surveys drop. That's not just mood. 
It's a proxy for capacity and willingness to spend from cash flow versus credit. Here's the contradiction most people miss. Sometimes recessions start during good news. Employment can be rising, markets can be near highs, orders can look fine. But if the cost of time has moved and balance sheets are mismatched, the snap is already in motion. Micro cracked. Macro decides. The calendar of a downturn. How it unfolds. Here's a typical sequence. Policy tightens while inflation is still elevated. Growth slows from trend to stall speed. Inventories build. Order books thin. Credit spreads widen. Small business surveys show tighter lending. Hours worked flatten before jobs fall. Layoffs gather in rate-sensitive sectors construction and manufacturing then spread. Finally, consumer spending slows in categories that depend on confidence and credit. Now add a supply shock. Energy prices jump. Margins compress for transport, chemicals and heavy industry. If the central bank tightens to counter the inflation impulse, the hit compounds through financing costs. If the central bank looks through the shock, inflation may stay higher for longer, keeping real incomes under pressure. Either road narrows growth. The route chosen sets the shape. Short and sharp or long and grinding. Tell one in 60 seconds. Watch real yields against growth. When inflation-adjusted yields rise while leading indicators slip, the system is paying more for time as earnings power falls. That combo cuts projects. Less building, fewer hires, thinner margins. Mid-script cliffhanger. If policy stays tight into weakening profits, the snap you saw won't be the last. A second sequence features credit first. Asset prices fall. Collateral values drop. Loan-to-value ratios jump without anyone touching the debt. Lenders ask for more equity or reduce lines. Firms sell assets at bad prices to meet calls. Selling begets selling. Income statements follow balance sheets down. Tell two in two minutes. Watch bank lending standards. When bank officers report tighter standards while demand for loans also falls, that's not caution. That's contraction taking shape inside the pipes that finance working capital. Historical parallels and their lessons. Here's a sharp example. In 1929, stock prices broke in October. By 1931, bank failures accelerated as collateral fell. Policy errors on money supply and currency pegs deepen the downturn. The lesson? Protect the plumbing or finance will shrink the real economy on its own. Another case, 1997 and 1998 in Asia. Currency pegs, short-term foreign debt, and maturity mismatches exposed banks and corporates. When capital left, currencies fell, making foreign debts heavier. Output contracted sharply until international support and policy adjustments stabilise flows. The lesson, external debt in a foreign currency is a recession amplifier, and the 2020 stop. Output fell fast, then rebounded as policy replaced lost cash flows with transfers, backstops and asset purchases. The lesson, when the shock's temporary and policy has space, a deep recession can be short. When the shock is structural and policy is constrained, it lingers. What ends a recession? Thresholds that reset the math. Here's the reset. Financing costs fall enough to reopen projects. Balance sheets repair through equity raises, write-downs or time. Inventories clear. Real incomes stabilise as inflation cools and wage gains catch up. Banks stop building reserves and restart growth lending. The flywheel turns the other way. So what tells say the turn is close? First, short-term rates move below inflation in real terms for a bit. Second, forward orders pick up while inventories fall. Third, credit spreads tighten before jobs improve. Markets often front-run the real economy by months, especially in market-centric systems like the United States. The scoreboard and the three tells, here's the part to watch next. Real yields versus growth, bank lending standards, and inventory trends against new orders. Those three decide whether a slowdown stays shallow or becomes a recession. In short, recessions look like surprises because they're led by the parts of the system most people don't watch. Finance moves first, production follows, jobs lag. Micro cracked, macro decides. Three line dashboard, auctions, firm or soft tells you about funding costs. Real yields, rising or falling tells you about times price, central bank flows, adding or pausing tells you about the backstop.